What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Monday, September 23rd, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy Newsbeat Stand-Up. Here are today's top headlines. First up, Georgia's clean energy out paces fossil fuels with new nuclear boost okay i'm glad we put that new nuclear boost in there i was gonna say if we've got wind farm coming it's gonna be interesting next up we'll head abroad stock drop germany ev sales tank 70 percent as eu's green dream falters next up staying on that ev thread heavy hitters ev smashes through guardrails raising new safety concerns that's a literal headline right there. it is <laughs> next up staying international in greece cyprus signs agreement with Greece on world's longest subsea high voltage cable. Super interesting. And we'll again stay abroad. Indian state oil refiner seeking long term deals with Russia. That is according to specific media sources. Stu will then toss it over to me. I will quickly cover what's going on in the oil and gas markets and then quickly touch upon rig counts where we did see a little bit of a drop. We will then cover all that and a bag of chips, guys. As always, I am Michael Tanner. Joined by Stuart Turley. Where do you want to begin? Hey, Michael, let's start with our buddies over there at Georgia. Georgia's clean energy outpaces fossil fuels with new nuclear boost. I am so happy that the nuclear community is getting this boost. For the first time ever, U.S. state of Georgia has more clean power than hydrocarbon fuel power in its grid. Would you have ever thought you'd hear that kind of a title without nuclear in it? I wouldn't. <laughs> well, no, I did not think that. We we it is we are not going to get to any kind of net zero without nuclear. Unit three and unit four at Plant Vogel near Waynesboro, Georgia, have started commercial operations in the past year, making Vodal the biggest nuclear power plant with nearly five gigawatts of total generating uh, capacity, surpassing the 4,200 New Mexico MW Palo Verde plant in Arizona. I've been to that plant in Arizona. That's a beautiful plant. It's a lot of megawatts. Holy smokes. It is. It took 15 years and a cost of $36.8 billion, more than twice the projected timelines. Michael, we can't make the energy transition if we don't behave. We've got to follow in the footsteps of the UAE. UAE did four years under budget and on time. You, you know, in order to do a nuclear reactor, Four years under budget and on time is a formula that we got to figure out. Yeah, I know. It's definitely something that we need to figure out. And yeah, it's I mean, that's a pretty big that's a lot of money. But hey, it goes to show that if you can't actually get one of these done, you can. There's a lot of energy and there's a lot of clean energy that can be involved with nuclear. But we have to figure out on the regulation side how to do it for cheaper. Yes. And the other big story this weekend, Michael, was the fact that Amazon is signing up or Amazon, one of the big tech companies is signing up with Three Mile Island for a 20 year extension to Three Mile Island for the ones that did not burn down, burn up or melt down. And I'm excited about that. No, I'm very excited. Now, under that that thirty six point eight billion dollars, if you break that down on a on a per kilowatt per hour basis, right. it's actually some of the most expensive energy relative to where, you know, other forms of energy like natural gas, fossil fuels, right. all this other stuff. So yes, it's clean. Yes, we love nuclear, but at that price point, it really doesn't make any sense. And this is maybe the first time I'll agree with the environmentalists. You know, the quote here from from Britton McCorkle, executive director of the Georgia Conservation Voters, co-author of the report. Votal is a cautionary tale for the rest of the country. Here in Georgia, we're stuck with the most expensive power ever produced. Nothing to take pride in. So it's a double-edged sword with some of this nuclear stuff. We've got to br- yes, we love nuclear, but we got to bring that cost down or else what are we actually doing? We well, have, when you could consider, have that into a, we could have had five Keystone pipelines. Exactly, and, and you know why it got that high? Well, it's because regulations. Of, I'm with you. 
Yeah, trillions of dollars that, that the Biden Harris administration has cost in regulatory actions. We Absolutely. did that story a month or so ago. Absolutely. Let's go to All the right, next what's one. next? Before we both get airsick, let's go to the next one. Shock drop. Germany's EV sales tank 70% as EU green dream falters. Holy smokes, Batman. Germany's EV faces 70% sales drop. People can't afford it when you have green energy policies equals deindustrialization equals inflation and add that on to people losing their jobs. In France, the EU's second largest market for battery electric vehicles, deliveries fell by 33% to uh, unbelievable the collapse in ev sales comes amid the concerns about their range high prices and the lack of charging infrastructure across the eu and i tell you what at least the eu has done better than the biden administration that they did was it 4.7 billion dollars and put in seven chargers (laughs) that's unbelievable it's almost as as good as our network infrastructure internet stuff that's been going on that's an unbelievable story oh that was yeah the oh. EVs are, 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 I think, you know, people are coming around on the EV standpoint that, you know, when you talk about all the critical minerals that go into it, you caught, you know, it comes again, range, high prices, all the lack of char- charging infrastructure. I mean, it's, it's, it's no way or it's, it's no wonder that this, it's no wonder this, this isn't working. No. And in fact, the, you take a look at the EU just pushed back, Italy's pushing back. Norway, they're even they're all pushing back right now and saying, "Hey, we're not going to do it uh, anyway." Let's let's go on here to the next one. Yep. EV, this one, EV hit heavy hitters smash through the guardrails at raising new safety concerns. The weight makes a difference. You know, you got Tyrus, who is a a huge man as a wrestler. I would not want to wrestle that man. Weight matters when you're driving and inertia and when you're fighting somebody. <laughs> this they use the test used a 7,140 pound 220 2022 Rivian R1 T truck with a barrier at 60 miles per hour with footage on this article showing the heavy EV completely blasting through the guardrail and launching over a concrete wall while sending chunks flying. You know what? If you're a bad guy and you're a terrorist and you want to invoke damage, get an EV. No, I mean, it's 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 really frightening. it's really it's really incredible and you'd think because a lot of the infra a lot of like the the actual quote unquote engine of an EV is actually in the back and a lot of and it's empty up front which also which is also scary to think about that the heaviest parts aren't even in the front and they're still slamming through guardrails it shows you how much new stuff is in this now you know they'll over time, they may or may not figure this out, but I, I, it's a super, super scary thing. And I encourage everybody, if you go click the the link in the article below, you'll have a link directly to this video. Oh, yeah. It, it's frightening. I'll tell you, I do want a Cybertruck. I, I, I'm just going to let you know right now. I saw the Cybertruck camper and I mean, I'm like, man, that, that, that's cool. I'm all in. I want a Cybertruck, but as a third car, I don't want it as a primary vehicle. I, I think. Cyber trucks because they're bulletproof or where we need to go. Let's go to Cyprus, Michael. Let's go run over. Cyprus signs agreement with Greece, world's largest subsea high voltage cable. What a waste of money. Greece and Cyprus have signed memorandum of understanding and an MOU to press ahead with subsea electric cable linking continental Europe to the East Mediterranean, the two countries said. The Great Sea Interconnector, the GSI cable, will link transmission network of Europe to Cyprus, 1.9 billion euros later to stretch to Israel. I I don't get it. 1,240 miles. Well, I mean... 3,000 meters deep. Yeah, I mean, hopefully we, you know, don't tell the Ukrainian seals that because they're going to be on this oh, one. Yeah, like, or Biden, a- Biden, I mean, Biden will say it ain't going to happen. No, this is terrible. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm completely with countries you. need to have energy security planned for things that they can control. 
if you try to tie your energy to other countries, you will be held hostage or disappointed. No, absolutely. I'm completely, completely, completely <laughs> with you. So now we're, we're all about network transmission. I'm all about connecting parts of the country. I'm not against this per se. We need, you know, you know, I think an electric cable is is probably, you know, why not build a pipeline? You know, it might be more cost effective, might be able to transmit more power per unit. But, you know, I'll leave that up to the energy ministries of Greece and Cyprus to, to decide. But hey, for only 1.9 billion euros, that's, I mean, hey, it's better than the nuclear plant that they just put in Georgia. Well, yeah, you're not, we're comparing regulatory issues versus stupidity. So I'm not sure which one is worse. Hey, no kidding. All right, let's go to India. <laughs> India. India state oil refiners seeking long-term deals with Russia. This one is pretty interesting is when India is the third largest consumer of crude oil, depends on imports up to 85% of its needs. You know, they don't do a lot of drilling over there. Russia mm -hmm. is India's top oil supplier, and New Delhi has noted that Moscow has been instrumental in ensuring the nation's energy security. This is only going to get more important because of more pipelines that are coming in, and this is very much important. Last month, India overtook China as the last, largest buyer of Russian crude. That is a lot of crude. No, it is. It is. It's it's a lot of crude. Obviously, India, as as you mentioned, Stu, does not do a lot of its own homegrown drilling. They import majority of the the fossil fuels that they get. Now, what they really want to do is they want these long term contracts, so they're not necessarily relegated to spot prices. We know India has become a huge buyer of Russian crude ever since the sanctions, because they were able to get it for a little bit of a cheaper cost. Right. So again, you know, Western countries, as this article points out, have been pressuring India to stop buying Russian oil, but the government over there, Modi, they, they've stayed strong. And again, what's good, you know, they turn around and say, well, it's good for the Indian people to have low cost energy. And, and, and they bring up a great point. The last line in here, Hardep Singh Puri from India stated that without Russian oil on the market, global prices would have hit 250 to $300 a barrel. Don't know that to be true, but I, I'll tell you what, Without Russian oil flooding the market, it would be natural gas also. The, the natural gas is huge around the world for Russian natural gas. Yeah, absolutely. So, all right, well, let's go ahead and jump into oil and gas finance overview. Before we do that, guys, we've got to pay the bills. As always, thank you for checking us out on the world's greatest website, www.energynewsbeat.com. Stu and the team do a tremendous job making sure that website stays up to speed. Everything you need to know to be at the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy and the oil and gas business. Go ahead and hit that description or the link in the description below for all of the links to the timestamps, links to the articles articles you can check us out on substack the energy news beat dot substack dot com and you can also hit the link in the description below to check out our direct working interest offering that we are partnering up with the team over at Pecos operate you can hit us up you can message me Stu or hit invest in oil dot energy news beat dot com if you want to check out more I mean, oil at the end of the week did end higher, but but let's go ahead and just look at overall markets on Friday. We we, we saw about a, a tenth of a percentage point drop in the S and P five hundred, about two tenths of a percentage point on the Nasdaq. Two and ten year yields were actually up 0.3 and 0.7 percentage points, respectively. Dollar index basically flat. We've seen Bitcoin up after the Fed lowered rates, but still down. We over this weekend here down about one percentage point, but still above sixty thousand at sixty two thousand six hundred and forty nine. Crude oil actually floundered a little bit on Friday relative to where we expected it to be. It's currently sitting at seventy one dollars even. That's where markets closed at. Does look like here as markets will open soon that that will be around that 7125 mark so we'll see as we roll over and you guys listen to this here on the 23rd where things are at Brent oil was actually up about three tenths of a percentage point 
7490 natural gas up another three percentage points two dollars and 41 cents mainly off the back of what's expected to be a really hot fall and the fallout from the hurricane that just went through the gulf of mexico i think the other thing we saw is you know crude oil inventories we did see have a pretty wide drop last week they're at the lowest levels they were on a week basis last week on a week over week basis from basically over a year you know the the, the fed obviously cutting 50 basis points is going to affect prices to the upside. I think that's what a lot of what you're seeing here. Lower rates is going to hopefully increase and stimulate, continue to stimulate whatever's left of the economy. And then that's going to continue to hopefully support prices above that 70 mark. We're up about four percentage points on oil benchmarks week over week. Obviously, the you know, if, if, if you read our friends over at Reuters, they're still talking about weakened Chinese demand. Again, some of that stuff may be overblown, but but also China being one of the biggest markets, there is something to be said there. So I think people are are watching that. The only interesting thing I saw, Stu, on, on Friday was rig counts. We did drop by about two, according to our friends over at Baker Hughes, which is which is pretty crazy. You're talking about 488 rigs as compared to 630 rigs year over year. We did see crude oil production fall to about 13 million barrels per day, which was down from their peak of 13.2 million barrels. So we were kind of seeing things run around. It's going to be interesting to see as things have gotten a little bit frothier in the markets where rig counts go. Obviously, rig counts are going to be a huge indicator of where current production is going to go. So if we're continually down 150 rigs, eventually production's going to, to latch. But to counter that argument I just put out there, you know, everybody is really moving from two to three mile lateral. So you're actually getting more oil per well, meaning that the number of rigs right. isn't necessarily correlated directly to how much oil is being produced. It's more of a, what is the oil productivity per foot and how many feet are we drilling on a week to week basis? So that's, in my opinion, the number to look at more so than we are looking directly at just the number of rigs and oh, oil production is going to crash because clearly it's not. There are things going on. Obviously, the stuff going on in Gulf of Mexico is continuing to rise. So lots of interesting stuff there. Go ahead and all of that is available again at energynewsbeat.com. That's really all I got, Stu. Nothing too crazy. What, what do you got? What should people be worried about this week? Well, just buckle up. Take care of your friends. Be prepared for any natural disaster, any hurricanes, or any non-natural disasters. It's always just good to be prepared. Yep. It's always good to be prepared. So, well, all right, guys. Well, with that, we'll go ahead and let you get out of here. Start your week and get back to work. We appreciate you guys checking us out here on the world's greatest podcast, energynewsbeat.com. For Stuart Turley, and Michael Tanner. We'll see you tomorrow, folks.